Good evening, I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2003 Fisher Family Distinguished International Fellow Lecture, which will be delivered by Fernando Enrique Cardoso, the former president of Brazil. Before introducing President Cardoso, though, I'd like to say a few words about the Fisher Family Distinguished International Fellows Program. It was inaugurated, created in 1999-2000 at the behest of U.S. Ambassador and former Deputy Special Trade Representative Richard Fisher, his wife Nancy, and the family of the late U.S. Congressman James M. Collins of Dallas, Texas. Uh, the Fisher family has been great friends of the school. Uh, Richard has been a great friend of mine. And fortunately, he's with us here this evening. And I'd like him to say a few words before I introduce President Cardoso. Richard. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here this evening. We're absolutely delighted that uh, Fernando Enrique Cardoza is this year's uh, lecturer under the Fisher Family Series. He honors our family. He honors our family not only because of what he's accomplished, but also because he brought Ruth with him, his first lady and his wife, who's with us this evening. Um, the purpose of this lectureship and the purpose of this fellowship is to single out leaders who change the destiny of their countries. It's a very small population when you think about it. Uh, not only was this man responsible for reversing the curse and exorcising from Brazil the curse of inflation, which to put it in perspective, was running at 2,500% per annum when he became finance minister. And I think this year it'll be at about 2.5%, uh, your legacy. Uh, to put that in perspective, that meant that for 30 years, his fellow Brazilians had not gone one week without seeing prices change in their society. Uh, not only because he is a brave leader of the 115 plus million people in Brazil, uh, have we worked with Joe Nye to bring him here and with the Kennedy School, but also because he showed remarkable skill in getting along with the United States. I happen to be a Texan. Our family is Texan. I worked for Bill Clinton. He used to describe Texas as uh, Baja, Arkansas. Um, and when I had the pleasure of meeting with President Cardozo when he was in office and as we were developing the Free Trade Area of the Americas Initiative, which now Brazil and the United States is co-chairing, under great duress. I came home and I said to my wife that I now understand Brazil being a Texan. Uh, Brazil is big. Like Texans, Brazilians think they're even bigger than the country. Uh, and very much like Texans, they're always trying to figure out how to get along with the United States of America. <laughs> uh, President Cardoza did it with distinction. He's a brave man. He's a leader. He suffered exile. Uh, he suffered mistreatment. He came back to his country and he led his country through the first fully democratic administration and then a second succession and now is distinguishing himself by his former presidency activity, including the speech tonight. And we are honored, Mr. President, to have you here. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Richard. This fellowship does something that uh, we find very important at the Kennedy School, which is to bring role models of what we mean when we talk about people who are both scholars and practitioners, who are able to combine real world know-how with academic expertise. And in uh, President Cardoso's case, it's impossible to separate the intellectual from the politician. He received his PhD from the University of Sao Paulo, and as a young sociologist in the 1960s, he achieved international recognition for his groundbreaking works on development in Latin America. His idea sparked a good deal of controversy, and after the 1964 military coup in Brazil, he was forced into a four-year exile in Chile and France, where he was also productive intellectually. When he returned home, he faced mandatory retirement, which is another way of saying, I think, as he told me yesterday, he was fired. Uh, from his academic post at the University of Sao Paulo because of his challenging ideas. His response was to found the Brazilian Center for Analysis and Planning, a think tank that could draw resources from international foundations. And under his leadership, the center became a beacon for Brazilian intellectuals who were stifled by the military regime. As Brazil became more open and democratic, Fernando Henrique Cardoso 
became involved in electoral politics. He was elected a senator from the state of Sao Paulo by a landslide in 1986. And two years later, he co-founded the Brazilian Social Democratic Party. He was appointed foreign minister in 1992 and finance minister in 1993. And his real plan was credited with bringing the runaway inflation that Richard talked about under control. And he managed to turn the troubled economy into a great success. And that paved the way for his presidential victory in 1994. As president, he promoted economic reforms and foreign investment while speaking widely about the opportunities and challenges of globalization. Shortly after his re-election in 1998, Brazil suffered a devastating financial crisis triggered by the forces of economic globalization. And many of his policy decisions that he had to take in those difficult times were deeply unpopular in the short term. But he was able to master the financial crisis which was a difficult test of his political leadership. The economy stabilized and began, began a firm recovery in mid-2000. But perhaps even more important than his success in the Brazilian economy was his success in Brazilian politics. He managed the transition to the new regime in Brazil with subtlety and skill, despite the fact that it was a different party coming in and thereby helped to consolidate the success of democracy in Brazil, something he had written about for years before. So please join me in welcoming this remarkable scholar politician to the Kennedy School. Thank you very much. Good. Oh, good evening. Thank you very much. You know, uh, I'm no more used to address to so huge audiences, so I'm a little bit shy and nervous. <laughs> I'm now a former president. I'm, I'm not more used to that. And so enthusiastic audience, and I don't know how to, to express my gratitude to uh, both uh, my, my, those who introduced me here, Mr. Fisher and uh, Professor Nye. Uh, as always, you know, the, the comments by both were based on generosity, much more than on objective analysis. Anyhow, I'm very grateful. And I think it is to me an honor to be here and to receive the, the invitation uh, to, to, to make this presentation tonight under this, uh, you know, uh, the Fish Family International uh, Fellowship and to be introduced by Professor Nye. Thank you very much. And uh, let me say, let me express my long-standing admiration for Professor Nye for your lucid and progressive views on international relations. And tonight I would like to address a subject of immediate interest to us all, which is the question of go global governance. But I know that most of you would prefer to uh, ask me about Brazilian and South American uh, problems and, and politics. No, no problem. After my, after I read this paper, it's a little bit, a little bit uh, uh, too vague. Maybe you can ask me whatever you want. I don't know if we'll be able to to answer, but anyhow, I will try. Yeah? Uh, so I, 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 I will try to concentrate now, being more specific, uh, to in sharing with you some thoughts about the prospects of democratic global governance. And let me start by stressing what Leibniz uh, would call a vérité du fait. Democracy has never enjoyed so many followers and so much, so much prestige as it does today. In our continents, democracy stands second to none as a standard for legitimated political authority. I'm not saying that every American, European, Africa, or Asian agrees on the decisive importance of uh, the value of democracy. What I'm suggesting is that the prevailing assumption nowadays is that people anywhere have good reason to see democracy as valuable. While 30 years ago such an assumption did not sound plausible at all, the appeal of a democratic ideal currently seems all but on the wane. The shift in attitude has been dramatic. Suffice it to recall the lengthy discussion 
Latin America intellectuals used it to hold during the 60s about what countries in the region would be fit for democracy. Now, the debate is centered on how to become fit through democracy. The nature of the debate has changed. And so has the political mindset of the national communities long associated with uh, authoritarian uh, vices. Globalization is much to be credited for this new state of things. I know it's not very popular to praise globalization, but in that point, I think it's correct to say that globalization uh, had a good consequence in that sense. Not in the sense that trade among nations has finally lived up to the civilization broad predicted by Montesquieu and the other advocates of the so-called les deux commerces. It is rather in the sense that new technologies patterns have facilitated cross-border dissemination of democratic values and practices. Information technology has empowered individuals and local communities worldwide, enhancing citizenry and broadening public space. One might even speak of a technology-driven democratic synergy among nations. In times of internet, it is unlikely that any community can remain oblivious for long to what is taught and discussed beyond its borders. Ideas and expectations now travel fast and can flourish wherever sensitive minds are available to pursue them. All the more so as social demands are increasingly generated by emulation. Consumption styles become global regardless of cultural or national differences. No less relevant is the fact that with the advent of technology information and the expansion of mass media, demands are being conveyed directly to government dispensing with traditional means of representation. As a result, not only political parties are put under pressure to update their means of interaction with society, but governments are asked to deliver services at a pace where uh, they were not used to. Office holders do not derive their legitimacy any longer from sustaining the right cause or launching the good combat, but from delivering well what their constituencies expect to them. Today's model is not what to do, but how to do in the most efficient and cost-effective manner. The information age has thus not only contributed to the spreading of democracy, but also helped introduce new patterns of legitimacy. But what matters most is not to trace down the roots of the democratic wave. Much more important is to ascertain how sustainable such a trend is. On what grounds could one assume that democracy has a long life in its new and old settings? Are democracy and capitalism in its current phase destined to drive side by side? I'm afraid no credible evidence bears such a sanguine conclusion. History has not reached a happy end except for those deterministic minds that take it as a libretto to the duly performed, with, performed without variation. One might at best speak of a mutually beneficial but open-ended coexistence between the information age and democracy. Hence, the utmost importance of paving the ground for a continued expansion of public liberties. This implies anticipating and tackling potential challenges to democracy. Some of those challenges are of a conceptual nature. Let me call attention to a fallacy some analysts and public figures have lately incurred in. I refer to the presumption that what has won broad acceptance is not democracy as a value, but concrete forms of representative government. Some circles in the West have gone as far as to producing roadmaps to guide newcomers in the realm of democracy. Signs vary one map to another, but they are customarily derived from the historic experience of a couple of mature Western democracies. It is as if democracy is a good, as a good, is subjected to intellectual property rights. Those who coined the currents first would be allowed to control any of its following issues. Now, new democratic experiments would only amount to variations around a single and long-established theme. 
Such a view is not deprived of philosophical backing. backing. In, it has recently been cautioned upon absolutist ethical viewpoints like those set by Leo Strauss. Back on the public agenda is the belief that it's worth say, uh, striving for the good, rational, and perfect society. To those gifted with a magic or metaphysical eye, it would be possible to know what the best spirit is, if not the best life for us all. I need not to stress the risks this uh, belief entails. Let me quote uh, Sir Isaiah Berlin, who spent his entire life alerting against the damage the idea of an all-embracing solution to human problems is likely to inflict upon societies. If a ruler, a class, a party, or a country is convicted that it holds the key to collect collective happiness, Berlin used to say, any price would be considered worth paying to see the redemptive mission duly accomplished. To make the ideal omelette, there would be no limit to the number of eggs that should be broken. The 20th century abounded with examples of how costly monist views are when acted out in the political scene. No effort should be spared to ensure that the 21st century fares better. It is true that there appears to be no ready-made prescription against fundamentalism, but it seems only sound to stress now and again the relevance of value pluralism. It is indeed high time to policymakers were reminded that the world is increasingly less prone to absolute notions of good and evil. The, they simply do not fit the world as it is. The international community is too diverse and complex to be straightjacketed into Manichaean schemes. Why do not recognize that we live under conf uh, conflicting but equally true values? Instead of ranking ultimate ends as right or wrong, we had better ba balance them in the most satisfactory and legitimate manner. After all, this is how our societies work. That is what democracy is all about. Democratic rules are nothing but the provisional outcomes of conflicts of values and interests being liable to revision whenever the majority so wishes. Here lies the explanation for how demo our democratic experiments being different from one another. An institutional arrangement struck in Berlin on, on the question of social welfare, for instance, will hardly prove relevant or even possible to Canadians, Albanians, or Australians, as it is uh, meant to reflect power disputes, social expectations, and traditions that are specific to the German people. This does not mean that Germans value social justice and neglect individual autonomy, while Argent Australians go the other way around. It only shows that nations, when self-governed, strike balance among values in line with their own set of priorities and resources. The corresponding results cannot but look unique. What democratic experience do have in common, let me insist, is the guarantee that decisions emanate from rule-based deliberative processes. If, is, uh, uh, if there is a feature that distinguishes decision-taking process in democracies, it is indeed a permanent trade-off among the actors involved. It comes thus as no surprise that contemporary thinkers like Albert Hirschman have suggested the, that modern democracies base their legitimacy on deliberation rather than on the predetermined general will. A, a legitimate decision would represent the deliberation of all and not the will of all. One may be tempted to ask by, by now why nations that have grown so accustomed to the exercise of give and take domestically continue to be so reluctant to abdicate from their sovereign rights when operating on the international scene. How come the significant, the significant increase in the number of democracies over the last decades has not been translated into a decisive drive to do away with the remnants of the old Westphalian order? The usual answer has been that pending the establishment of a legitimate supranational authority, the nation state continues to be the sole safe haven 
for the exercise of popular sovereignty. One could always replicate that democracy among nations can only be built through its very exercise, as it has been the case in the domestic dimension. Be it locally or at the world level, democracy is essentially a cosa affare, or in other words, an open-ended process. It is therefore only contradictory to hold up the construction of a democratic experiment until conditions are deemed uh, mature. But one must recognize that some important steps have been taken over the last decade in the direction of democratic global governance, most of them under the aegis of the United Nations. Let me recall the series of sovereignty limit limiting agreements in the fields of disarmament and the environment that were negotiated after the reactivation of the UN in the post-Cold War. Even more promising was the creation of the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court has indeed been a daring step toward a cosmopolitan judicial system. If domestic remedies fail, the court can, through mandatory decisions, hold individuals accountable for systematic violation of human rights. What is vindicated by the developers like the International Criminal Court is the universal validity of human rights. These rights relate to individuals, not in their capacity as citizens of a particular state, but, on, but for their human condition, deserving therefore supranational protection. How should one interpret this groundbreaking development during, during the 90s? Would it be fair to assume that what Immanuel Kant termed as the cosmopolitan condition is, after all, a feasible goal? Well, it is too early to tell. The absence of major powers in this process is not an encouraging factor. Neither is the political stalemate caused by the latest disagreements on international security. Some have come to the point of fearing a return to a pre hobbesian state. The appalling threat of terrorism stands as a sword of Damocles over us all. As the international community has not succeeded in defining a common strategy to fight such a little told diffuse enemy, unilateral response has been in the vogue again. But there are some countervailing trends to be uh, reckoned with. The most meaningful one seems to be the emergence and gradual consolidation of a world civil society. I refer to the public space set by the widening and diversified network of non-state actors. It is true that not everything that emanates from this new arena sounds progressive. Now and then, regressive utopias are brought to the floor. The radical ecology discussed is a case in point. On denying our capacity to, to command nature through science and technology, it placed modernity under a negative sign. But others have been preaching isolationism as the best therapy. The level of a country's exposure to economic and security risk would be commensurated to the extent to its interaction with the outside, outside world. It goes without saying that neither way is sustainable in the long run. After all, the clock of history is unlikely to run backward. Nor should it do so. If we were to succeed in dispelling global threats, it would be through more rather more than rather sorry, it would be through more rather than less technical innovation. Our very capacity to tell how concrete and imminent those threats are is contingent upon available knowledge and technological resources. We know for certain that we are not speaking of local phenomena. No place on earth is impervious to the effects of occurrences in, like climate change, infectious diseases, financial crisis, drug trade, or terrorism. They cut across national jurisdictions. There is no room for autarkic solutions. Transnational problems require global responses. Hence the importance of the gradual but decisive emergence of a transnational civil society. As it is as if issues of universal validity have found their alma mater. Suffice it to bear in mind the crucial role played, played by civil society groups in the convening and development of the global conferences on the questions of the environment, 
human rights, women, and racial discrimination. Not to mention the contribution given by them to the negotiation of important instruments like the Land Mines Treaty and the Convention on Climate Change. It is exactly on their activism rather than on any external mandate that rests the legitimacy of non-state actors. They are what they do. I only hope they think bigger and do bigger, moving beyond an issue-oriented approach and ad addressing questions like the deficit uh, in the global governance. Instead of piecemeal uh, claims against globalization, it is time we hear a consistent call for the renewal, not the destruction, of the multilateral structure. Economy has turned global, but politics has not. The interdependence of markets has not been matched by an updating of the Bretton Woods system. The international community is still lacking mechanisms that could effectively follow up and control financial volatility. Such a lacuna was first noticed and discussed long before the recent financial crisis. The founding fathers of the International Monetary Fund, like uh, themselves, like, like Lord Mena Keynes and Harry Dex White, were in agreement as to, do, as to the, the need to some measures of intelligent control of, of capital flows. Let me recall that their uh, point was duly reflected in Article 6 of the IMF F's Articles of, of Agreement, which allows the fund to request a member state to exercise controls so as to avoid the necessity of drawing on the organization's reserves. It is not high time that such a dead letter is brought into force. Rather than charting into rough waters, we would be simply doing justice to the historical vision of Keynes and White. Other improvements in the Bretton Woods framework should also be pursued to the benefit of global governance. Why not to update the voting power system of the IMF so as to better reflect today's world? Claims for greater transparency in the funds procedures could also be met, especially with regard to the stabilization plans. The United Nations system is not exempt uh, of reform either. The composition of the Security Council has long become obsolete. A more representative council would certainly mean a council that delivers more and better. The methods of the organization could also be improved with so that it could be better favor the goals of the Millennium Declaration. A step in that direction has been decided by the Secretary General Kofi Annan to broaden the discussion on ways to strengthen the participation of the civil society in the UN system. I am perfectly aware that governments hold the primary responsibility for improving the multilateral financial and political architecture. But again, nothing prevents the world civil society from adding its voice to calls of interest to the welfare of millions. By arguing, denouncing, proposing, and innovating, civil society groups can make a difference. More than that, they can help produce and disseminate a new ethics for international relations. The goal of democratic global governance is unlikely to be attained by political engineering alone. A new and more inclusive order we will only prosper if informed by cogent and universal values of solidarity and tolerance. Americans and Brazilians are entitled to be good partners in church adventure. Our nations have been plural from the outset. Our background is European, but we managed to call in new peoples and cultures. Multiculturalism is our trademark, not to mention uh, social mobility. We are definitely forward-looking nations. Let us continue to strive together for a more democratic and peaceful future for us all. The United States deserves it. So does Brazil, and so does the world at large. Thank you very much.
We now have time for questions. We have two microphones here on the floor, two in the balconies, and uh, I will give my usual reminder that questions are short to the point and end with a question mark and come one per customer. Uh, so who would like to ask the first question? Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Juan Fernandez. I'm a first year at the business school. And I wanted to see if you can touch a bit about the issue of Argentina. Um, I was lucky enough to be down in Buenos Aires and meet with uh, a new minister of economy when the crisis was ongoing and sort of found out a few days later that he was forced to resign because when he announced his economic program, the pensioners, the students took to the street, the president sort of withdrew his support and he didn't have any in Congress. And my basic question is this, from your perspective, both as a president and also sort of as an academic, what do you see as the root cause of what happened in Argentina? But beyond that, how do you sort of see economies in countries like Argentina and Brazil reconciling the domestic needs of the people and at the same time serve the economic reality, which is globalization, the capital markets, the IMF, Washington consensus? Thank you. Well, very simple problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, first of all, in the case of Argentina, you refer specifically to, uh, the main question was the lack of confidence in political men. In the last years, the Argentina's uh, uh, population in Argentina, the people in Argentina, was looking uh, you know, uh, to the government, different governments, and uh, having the sense that the governments were working uh, on questions completely isolated from people's needs. And as you know, some you know, very complicated uh, uh, at least uh, accusations in terms of, of uh, uh, corruption uh, and, uh, and this kind of thing uh, contribute to, to demoralize the political system in Argentina. On the other hand, uh, in the past, uh, the President Menem and mainly uh, Cavallo have been able and competent in implementing a program and the program gave the Argentinians the, same, the feeling that they could maybe uh, I regain the uh, glorious past and by, by pegging the, the peso uh, to the dollar. This is, was a, a positive at uh, uh, one point in time, and then it became much more difficult because of exports, because of the world crisis, because of Brazil, because of uh, you know, uh, Mexico and uh, Russia, so on and so forth. And I think uh, the main question in, that, in such a situation is that if the domestic structures, political structures, and democratic structures in general are not uh, working well and are not uh, inspiring you know, confidence in people, it's extremely difficult to present any kind of solution for the situation. And that's what occurred in Argentina. In spite of the, the good quality of some of the ministers, of the goodwill of some of the presidents, they have no, uh, no way how to, 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 to deal with the situation. So now it's different because with Argentina's uh, elected president, it was very interesting, the, the case, because he, the president was elected by 22, 23 percent of the, of the voters. So in a, in a very thin base, very difficult. And the president was able, up to now at least, to regain co uh, confidence. So this, was, this is basic. This was, was number one. So now the problems are just uh, beginning, you see? So the Argentinians have an enormous foreign debt. They, uh, they, 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 they had a moratorium. They decided not to pay. They, they were in bankruptcy. Still, they are negotiating the IMF. But uh, the, the, the agriculture is uh, in, in good shape. And raw materials prices are increasing now in recently. So I think the Argentina, Argentina has a chance because of the, the kind of coincidence between a good uh, moment in, 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 in economic terms because of the world market and because of the legitimacy that the, the, uh, now the, 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 new, the new government has. So that's, it, that's the way. But this, there is no uh, recipe to solve the, the, this kind of question. But uh, it, what is clear is it's not enough to have technical competence, you have to, to have also political legitimacy. If you have both, maybe you can cope with this so difficult challenge 
posed by the, the globalization. Please introduce yourself and ask your question on the left balcony. Hello, my name is Amy Nunn, and I'm a doctoral student at the Harvard School of Public Health, and I'm doing my dissertation research in Brazil. I'm wondering if you can comment on the future of generic drug production at the s and the sustainability of Brazil's uh, AIDS treatment and prevention programs. Well, as probably most of you know, uh, what we did in Brazil in the last years was a, a joint effort to, to curb the expansion of, of uh, AIDS and HIV. This has been done uh, because we, first of all, we ask the uh, popular support for the program. I mean, NGOs have been involved, and those who already have been infected by HIV or are uh, suffering from AIDS were asked to cooperate with the government. Inside the government, you see, yes, and also uh, uh, among the, the social groups. And this has been very positive. Secondly, we decide to, you know, to, to use the mass media to inform the population about the risks uh, produced by AIDS. And instead of, of asking people just not to do sex, we said, uh, safe sex. This is easier. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not easy to, to, uh, to assume the responsibility to propose because some segments in this church oppose in families, so it was not, it was not a, a, a easy political decision. Anyhow, it works uh, very well. And thirdly, what you referred to, uh, we have been very firm in negotiating with the, the pharmaceutical industry in Brazil. We ha you know, Brazil signed the, a, a treaty on intellectual rights uh, uh, cooperation, something like that, the property intellectual rights, and uh, under the auspice of this uh, treaty, it's possible to compulsorily uh, oblige uh, industries to produce medicine as far as the medicine is needed for the well-being of people. So we threaten some of the big companies uh, to do that. And of course, the Brazilian uh, laboratories have the capacity to produce. And uh, finally, the multinationals uh, came into a, a kind of agreement with the government and the, the price has been dramatically reduced. And this has been reaffirmed in, in, in Doha, in the Doha meetings. And again, uh, together with other people, the Brazilians have, have been very active in, in, you know, in, in defending the necessity of, of keeping the idea that in some circumstances, the pharmaceutical industries have to, you know, to produce in, uh, when the government is asking for a, a, a cheaper produ uh, production. So altogether, this uh, allowed us to, 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 to curb you know, uh, the expansion of, of AIDS. Uh, the, the point is, this is not a program uh, based on, in, only in one government. It is, it's a, it is the state in Brazil is, uh, you know, is controlling the program. So in spite of, uh, of changes in government, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure the orientation will be the, the, the same now, and that there is no reason. To, to doubt that the, the President Lula will continue to do the, the same. Now what is important is to try to, to use our experience in dealing with mainly with the African countries, because African countries are really threatened by AIDS and, and, uh, and uh, HIV. And uh, it will be extremely important to not, not just to, to, to send money, but to, 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 to explain how to deal with and the point is that the social, civil society in, Africans, in some African countries uh, are much more feeble than ours. So how to, can we ask them to help the government? But it will be necessary. It is important to ask for participate. What I try to, to, to explain in my paper, in our days the important thing is not just to have legitimacy because we have vote. It's important to include people in the, deliber in the deliberation. So to, it's, diffi it's difficult. It depends on what, what, what the issue. But then how this is what really counts, because if people are not motivated, they just don't pay attention to the decision by government. So it's much more difficult to be, that's why I'm so happy now, to be in government in our days than it was before, because we, uh, and it's, it's better for society now, so because society is asking for you know, more information, more participation. But provided we understand that, Provided you use the mass media uh, as uh, 
collaborators to, to the, the, the implement, for in, in the implementation of, of uh, a, a policy, I think it's possible to, to reach uh, uh, good results. So I think it's feasible in Africa to, to make an effort and, uh, and always looking at the, the pharmaceutical industry because they have to reduce price, but uh, putting all these factors together, it's possible to, to afford the situation there. Right, Daphne. Uh, good evening. Um, I, uh, Please was, introduce yourself. Okay, I'm a student here at the Kennedy School in International Development. Um, I, after listening to your speech and your focus on democracy, I'm from one of your neighboring countries, from Venezuela, and I'm particularly interested in your assessment of, of our democracy and its uh, future. Obrigado. <laughs> This is still more difficult to answer. <laughs> That's it. Well, let me say, very frankly, I know quite well your country, I know the president, I know the opposition, etc. And of course, uh, for, for us Brazilians, it's very important to see Venezuela in a democratic road. Uh, I think uh, that what is happening in Venezuela is, uh, is a pity, because when a society divides, splits, in a very profound way, uh, does not matter who will win, it will be impossible to govern. Uh, I, I, well, I experienced uh, similar situations in other moments in, in history. In my own country, uh, in the early 60s, uh, uh, in Chile, uh, I was uh, not there, I lived in, uh, in Chile for many years, but before Allende, but when Allende was elected, I was back there, uh, and I, I saw what happened when the, the society uh, split. Hmm? It's almost impossible to, to, to govern. So that's what really, you know, to me is, is very complicated in, in, the, in the situation of Venezuela, because it's, it's divided. I don't know who will, who will win. I think it's very important to follow constitution. See, I think that the, uh, Chavez was elected. Uh, so the only way, if the, if the population uh, uh, pre prefer to change the president is through, uh, through the constitution, you see? So they are trying to do that now. And uh, the, the, the pre President Chavez included in the Venezuelan constitution the power uh, of, uh, for, for the people to, to, from time to time, if, you, if a consistent number of, pe of people asks for a re to, to a renew the, the, the elections, it's, it's feasible. It, it requires 20%, I guess, of the total amount of the, the voters, and then an election will occur. I don't know who will win the election. It's difficult to, to, to say, but I'm sure, uh, uh, in any case, the situation will continue to be bad, because you have to, to, to try to reconcile. It will, it will be very important. You know, the, the leaders have the responsibility you know, to make a deal in the name of the national interests and people's interests. <laughs> So this is the main question in Venezuela. If President Chavez will be, will be able to, again, to be elected, first of all, if the opposition will be uh, capable to, 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 to join 20% of, of, of signatures, and if after that Chavez will elect, he has responsibility, uh, historical responsibility, to make a deal with, with the opposition, to try to reconcile, and vice versa. Otherwise, we will, we will pay a very high price for a long time. So this is, very, is the core of, of the democratic pro problem. It's not just necessary to have elections. You have to, 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 to forge consensus in, 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 in at, at some point in history to, uh, not, to, not, not, to, not to make people suffer too much. Thank you. Right side. Uh, my name is Yunita Grigorova. I'm an, an MPID graduate and currently a researcher at the Kennedy School. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, you were talking a lot about global governance and uh, democracy, and uh, my question is related to the decision-making process in, um, in the global architecture. Yes. You, you mentioned the importance of the United Nations, and if you look at the way that de decisions are taken within the United Nations, you would see a very democratic system where each country has one vote. But, um, if you look at some other international organization like the World Bank or the IMF, you would see a completely different um, decision-making system where um, basically the, your vote is based on uh, your quota. Now, if you're from the IMF or the bank, you would say 
well, that's fair. It's my own money, so I have the right to control how it would be spent. Yeah. But if you're a developing country borrower, you would say, um, but I'm paying interest, so uh, it's not that fair. Plus, I've never seen a democratic system based on the principle of one uh, vote per dollar. So, uh, <laughs> so well. uh, um, <laughs> what, what do you think? Do you think yeah. that it's a fair system, or do you think it needs to be reformed? And no, I, yes, I, why? If not, why? Thank no, you. no, no doubt. I, I said before, I think it, it needs to be reformed, no doubt. Look the IMF which is uh, one of the key institutions for us. I, I refer to Keynes and White. It's very interesting to, 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 to go back again to the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the funding fathers of IMF ideas. They had a quite different idea about the IMF. The, the, the basic idea was to transform, to create, after the, the Second World War, the idea was, well, trade will increase. Globalization was uh, you know, there, you see? The, 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 even, even the concept was not existent yet, but anyhow, trade will, will, will expand. So we, we need more, uh, more free capital flows. If you have capital flows, free capital flows in different countries, it's possible to have some crisis of liquidity. At one point in, in time, a nation had been without uh, enough money to, to face the, 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 the trade uh, flow. So why not to organize a central bank of the central banks? That was Keynes' position, yeah? to solve the problem of liquidity. So along the IMF, to have a, a specific currency. Well, Mr. White at the time was the finance minister, of the United States finance minister, and he opposed. He said, no, it's not necessary to have a, a specific currency. The dollar is enough. Of course, Keynes was a... Was a uh, Britain, so he preferred not to have the, uh, the, you know, the dollar as the, the, the worldwide uh, currency. Well, but the dollar ha has become the, the, you know, the, the basic money in, uh, for the IMF. Some uh, years later on, uh, White changed his view. He said, no, no, we need a specific uh, currency. So now they have a specific currency, the special rights to, I don't know what. Anyhow, uh, and by the way, this, the, Mr. White has been uh, blamed as pro-communist because he tried to invite the Soviet <coughs> Union to participate in the IMF, and Stalin refused. But anyhow, uh, McCar uh, McCarthy asked him to come to, to you know, one of the hearings at, at the at Senate, and White died because of that. Two days after that, he had a, a heart attack. <laughs> so the IMF started very badly. <laughs> But anyhow, the idea was to, to, to give more uh, room for maneuver to the IMF, more money to, 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 in order to be able to, to you know, to, in, in some circumstances, to cope with crisis. This never worked like that. So the IMF became, uh, to my mind, uh, is now is, uh, I would say, uh, maybe an unusual thing, is weak. We need a, a, a stronger IMF. But a stronger IMF means with more room for maneuver, with more uh, money available, less dependent on the American treasury. Because today, the IMF depends on the American treasury. Everyone who has been pre present, and I'm in front of another one, knows that when the situation is very difficult, it's better to call by phone the American president than the head of the IMF. <laughs> and the American president normally has more sensitivity uh, then you imagine you, then the, <laughs> then the head of the IMF, <laughs> because the president has a political view, so he knows, for instance, that Argentina cannot just be left alone. It's necessary to to, to give a lift to the to, to the Argentina at one point in time. And technically, when look uh, data, well, it's impossible to well an, an an additional loan to that country is impossible. So it's like that. In order to, to avoid this kind of political you know, way, uh, way out, I think it is necessary to, to look at the governance, IMF governance, in an ample way. So not as today, because today is not just the one dollar, one vote. No, no, no vote at all. When the, the situation is really very difficult, only one vote in, irrespective of the number of dollars. See? We Brazilians are fighting to have a, a, a bigger share in IMF. 
We are entitled to have more. But it will be senseless because the, the IMF has a small amount of money and the, the, the governance, the effective governance is outside of the IMF. So we have to, to when I am referring to the reform and the, the architecture of the, the, the global world, the global the governance, like President Clinton used to say, the, the, world, the global architecture, I'm referring to that. You have to, to reform as well as the World Bank. Just one small comment. The World Bank has, uh, for loans, the same amount of money about uh, that the Brazilian Bank for Development has. And the Brazilians are complaining, the Brazilian uh, businessmen are complaining the scarcity of resources. Imagine what can be done by the World Bank at the world level. Yeah. It's about 12, maybe 15 billion dollars. This is nothing. For us, it's enormous, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> From a global point of view, this is nothing. So it's, uh, it's better necessary to think about uh, the, the world world again with ample views, including more money <coughs> and more uh, democratic control. Good evening, uh, Dr. Cardoso. Uh, my name is Olga Murcia. I'm a political science student at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. My question, uh, because of your knowledge in economics of Latin America, I wonder what your, your opinion or what could you predict would happen if uh, the free trade agreement of uh, if the Americas was adopted and if you believe the consequences would be similar to those that have happened uh, to Mexico with NAFTA. Thank well, you. It depends on the content of the, the agreement. You know, up to now, we are discuss, discussing, uh, discussing only you know, in general terms, and not, not yet concretely. What will, what will be the, the, you know, the, the meat and muscles of this uh, agreement? We don't know. Up to now, it's just we are discussing what kind of issues have been, shall be included in the agreement. And at the beginning, the idea was, well, let's discuss everything. Yeah? Let's discuss you know, procurement, uh, investment, access to markets, subsidies, uh, anti-dumping, et cetera. Yeah? A, a comprehensive uh, you know, set of questions in such a way that it would be possible to say, well, OK, I will take some advantage in entering into this kind of, of, of pact. But now the decision was quite different. The decision was, well, let's offer different uh, uh, possibilities, and each country uh, will decide if it uh, takes or not one or another of, this, of, of, the, of those possibilities. So it's a kind of, uh, again, a piecemeal approach to the problem of trade, and uh, some people are very happy with that. And, uh, I'm not happy. I think that it would be better to discuss more in depth, to have a, truly a free trade, but truly, in, in, you know, uh, all embracing. Uh, and you will have to discuss, is, is it good for my country or not? This, uh, uh, each one has to, dis to, to discuss very s seriously that. So now it's different. Now I, I will say, no, no, this uh, is good for Brazil, that, the other thing is not good for Brazil. But we are simply put aside the fact that the US government can do bilateral agreements, as, as has been uh, done with Chile, uh, and now is being prepared with uh, Peru and Colombia. And then the Argentinians and Brazilians, if they will be apart, they will, they will have to compete with the American manufacturers in Chile, in Peru, in Colombia, without having any, any advantage vis-a-vis -vis the, the American market. So I think, I, I, I think this is, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in a very difficult moment with, with the FTAA. Let me say, to, to conclude, uh, that there is another question. The Mexicans prefer not to have any FTAA because they have already. The Chileans, uh, for, to Chile applies the same, you see? Brazilians and, Arge and, and Argentinians are looking with some suspicions. And I suppose the American Congress is also a little bit uh, skeptical vis-a-vis -vis free trade. Well, at least what I'm watching on TV here is always against. Yesterday was some people, some manufacturers were so furious because Apparently, President uh, uh, of the United States, President Bush, is about to, to, to comply with a WTO decision on steel. And the reaction is very, very strong against this. 
So the, the moment is not very favorable to free trade. It's a, it's a rhetoric in favor of free trade, but the, in practice, we, have, we are looking uh, across the world and every nation trying to protect. So this is an, again another contradiction because the productive system is global and we, we need markets. The, the productive scale is enormous. Even a country like Brazil, it's a big, has a big market. It's not enough. We need more markets. So we have to, to, to discuss more profoundly what the consequences are in terms of, 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 of trade agreements and not just to look at with ideological aisles and saying, well, I'm, I'm afraid it's bad or it's good. I don't know, could be good or bad. It depends on the, our capacity you know, when we are negotiating. And you have to be self-confident that, that you have uh, competence enough and, and it's, it's, we, are, we are baked uh, in our countries to, to, to go ahead with a good negotiation. That's my view. Dr. Bobby. Thank you. My name is Simeon Nictor. I'm a student of international development here at the Kennedy School. Mr. President, over the past 20 years, your country has had amazing social and economic advances. In fact, the UNDP um, just came out with a report that said no other country had a higher jump in the human development ranking than Brazil. However, <coughs> these advances have not been shared by everyone in your country. Um, Brazil has the sixth highest level of the uh, Gini coefficient and a measure of inequality, and the other five countries ahead of Brazil um, are all in South Africa. Could you please comment on inequality in your country and please give any recommendations uh, to President Lula on what he may be able to do to combat it? <laughs> well, <laughs> the last part is impossible, you see. <laughs> President Lula knows quite well what he has to do. And presidents don't like to have receive, you know, counsels from former presidents. <laughs> but anyhow, what matters is the inequality problem. What you, you, you are stressing is an important point. It's true that in the last uh, decade, all, uh, all indicators regarding to uh, how, how the, the UN has this, the, the, this measure on, uh, I don't know, quality of life improvement uh, are positive in Brazil. Uh, all all you know, indicators. Uh, but Gini coefficient is not that good, on the contrary. But when we look more in, uh, in depth, the Gini coefficient, the last, the last uh, publication and the World Bank is about to publish a very, in, very, very good uh, report on uh, inequalities in, in the world or in Latin America, you see that in spite of all, even the Gini coefficient is, uh, in Brazil is moving toward the better, very smoothly, but anyhow, when you look what happened, uh, uh, taking each one of the 10 groups in the, from the wealthiest people to the poorest people, you see that the poorest people are increasing uh, a little bit more quickly than the, the others. And the, 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 the top 1% is losing in comparative terms. This is published in this the new report by, by the World Bank. Uh, what I'm saying is not to justify inequalities in Brazil, because this cannot, it has not justification. It's impossible. We have to fight against inequalities. But this, what I, I'm stressing is that we are making some very small movements to, in, a, in, a, in a world of inequalities toward a little bit more uh, equal uh, situation in Brazil. But what counts is the level, the poverty level, and access to you know health, education consumption of goods, and this is improving, but, but dramatically improving in the, the poorest uh, sectors of, of the Brazilian population. Uh, to some extent, there is a kind of basic contradiction when we are asking for more equality, because the capitalist system produces inequalities. Huh? It, 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 I said this to the World Bank. You are asking the governors in Latin America to work to become more equal, but you have to be consistent with, with your views. So why not to speak about socialism? Because if you want equality, this is not capitalism. The capitalist system produces inequalities. When a, a nation starts by accumulating very fast, becoming developing, developing country, it increases inequalities at the beginning because it requires more capital accumulation. You see, even here, well, in some moments when, when the, 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 the system is, is going up very, very quickly, no, inequality uh, expands. On the contrary, 
If you look Africa, in Africa, inequality is decreasing because everyone is becoming more, more poor. <laughs> and the rich are becoming poor more quickly than the poor. But that's not good. Huh? What is good is to improve the, 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 the base of society. And if possible, to decrease inequalities. But when we turn the argument around and ask only for inequality, it's a kind of contradiction. Because you are asking inequality and ask for more capital accumulation, for more investment. It's impossible in a capitalist system. So, you know if you understand my point. So what we really have to ask is quality of life for poor people. And then inequality. But quality of life can increase more rapidly then the inequality decreases, because the inequality is inherent to the capitalist system. At least, was, uh, what, when I was stud is, uh, stu a student, I learned. I don't know. <laughs> if, maybe the capitalist system has changed a lot, I don't know. Right, stop me. Uh, good, e good evening. My name is Brian Gillis. I'm a <coughs> freshman at the Harvard College. And my question isn't specific to Brazil, but rather to the political theory ideas you discussed. Um, you, you spoke a lot about multilateralism, and I very much agree that multilateralism is essential in today's global eco uh, economy and politics. However, um, I was wondering, do you believe that unilateralism in today's international political scene is outdated or absolute, absolute, or is there any case or situation in international politics you could see unilateralism being justified? Well, when it's possible to justify unilateralism, when multilateralism stops, and there is a situation of crisis. That, in that moment, we will have no, no more argument to say, no, we have, we have to wait for a common decision if no one is taking decision. So the price to be paid to, for those who are in favor of multilateralism is to, make to, to, to run the multilateralist system. I'm referring to the United Nations directly. You see, I am very much in favor of the United Nations of multilateralism, but it's necessary for, in, in order to have a moral you know, support for that position, the United Nations have to be more active. Take the case of Iraq. During years and years and years, decisions are not implemented in Iraq. So this is very bad, because at the end, it gives a kind of justification for those who have acted unilaterally. I was against, but anyhow. Uh, if, we, if we had a more active United Nations, it would be much easier for those who are in favor of multilateralism to say, no, we cannot go into war without the United Nations support. So that's the, the moment when it can maybe, I don't know, justify, understand uh, unilateral uh, action is when the multilateral system is not working. So but the, bad, the good thing to do is to try to, 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 to to force the multilateral system to work, you see? And I think this is feasible. Uh, it has been done several uh, times, and we have to recover that capacity now. And I think that, again, the, the situation in Iraq is very important, because now, again, it, 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 the situation there shows that it's maybe more simple to win a war than to make peace. And in order to make peace, we need more support. It's better to have a multilateral uh, system than a unilateral system, even if the unilateral system is strong enough to impose a rule. Impose for how long and at what price? So as, uh, I believe that uh, you, have, you have good arguments to continue to be multilateralist. Right good evening. My name is Carlos Diaz. I'm a graduate of the Kennedy School and now a PhD student in the Department of Government studying presidents. So my question is about Latin American presidents. Um, recently, throughout the region, we have seen a move towards the left in the election of presidents, uh, including Brazil. So, um, some argue that it's, there's even a renewal of the left in Latin America, and I wanted to ask you your opinion on why you think that is the case, and more importantly, what the implications of that move are, especially for that balance between sound economic policies on one hand and sound politics on the yeah. other. Well, I think that uh, you know, it's normal in the democracy to have this kind of balanced system, and from time to time, the, the public opinion moves from one position to another one, the, the only risky situation would be if, if you, it depends on uh, both right and left, if both, uh, right and left are respectful to the constitution, democracy is okay, you see? In our case, I, I, I may say to you that there is no risk in that sense. The, you know, the, 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 the uh, Lula's party is, uh, well, Lula said in the other day, I never was a leftist, huh? he said. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
But I, I believe that the, his party was, or is, a leftist party. But, but his party is also committed to democracy, you see? That is no, I think it's normal. We have, the, we have to, to understand this, that it's normal. In Europe, many, many times in Europe, in, in the past, in, in France, in Italy, yeah, you have uh, uh, well, leftist parties in, in, in government. It's normal, no, no problem. With respect to the, the relation between the economics and the leftist approach, again, I think the enormous changes in the world oblige those who are in government to take into account not just ideologies but also uh, circumstances. You see, I don't. I mean, I'm not uh, expressing the, the view that there is only one way. There are different ways. It's possible to, in, in some circumstances, to change here and there, and even in, you know. Uh, it, it depends on the way we are uh, obtaining your results and uh, on what grounds, who, who are supporting your views. You can change it. I think it's possible. I don't think that in Latin America we are now looking, to, uh, uh, looking a kind of a, a move toward leftists government in the old sense. They are much more nationalist governments and statists than leftists in the old sense, I mean, in the proper sense. They are nationalists and, and, and statists, much more than they, they, I don't, I don't, what, what was the proposal by one of these governments in terms of control of pro property, collective property, or even to, to expand the share uh, in decision making in a, in, a, in, a, in a business and a company by uh, unions? Nothing, nothing. They are just asking for more nationalism and a little bit more of state interference in economic life. It's not leftism. It's another phenomenon, perceived as if it will be a leftist phenomenon. It's another one. And it's, it's understandable. It's understandable, too. I'm not justifying it. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, trying to, 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 to explain. Because, you know, globalization produces a tremendous earthquake in, in, in normal lives, you see? So it's very uh, uh, surprising to see in France, for instance, Beauvais, which uh, you know, the peasant leader, very regressive in his ideas, very hyper-protectionist, you see? Very aggressive, very, uh, you, you, those who know France, the, 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 the kind of Pujadism, uh, the old uh, writer's uh, peasant leader. There is no difference between Beauvais and Pujad. In spite of that, Beauvais becomes a kind of icon of the anti-globalization, anti and then consider leftist, my God. <laughs> poor, poor left. <laughs> We're running out of time. This will have to be our last question. It has to be quick. Uh, uh, Mr. President, good evening. Uh, my name is Paulo Marquez. I'm a Brazilian student at MIT, so I'm particularly honored of your presence here. Yep. Uh, I would like you to, basically following the same line, I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the political maturity of uh, the Brazilian system and uh, whether or not it's time to reforms on the political system in Brazil. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think that uh, what, I don't know, is that what we are referring as political system? I would say to you that in, term, in general terms, the Brazilian uh, society has become more and more democratized. Not the political system in itself, the Brazilian society. That is to say, we have more organized people trying to, 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 to fight for their own interests and being, being no more afraid of repression or of governments. We have uh, an atmosphere of freedom. Uh, free, uh, the press is completely f free, totally free, uh, as well as the unions or the churches. Nobody is politically afraid. We have, we have other kind of, of, of problems of preoccupation in terms of, of violence, but not political violence social violence, crime, but not political violence. So in that sense, I would say that Brazilian society becomes much more uh, uh, mature and m much more uh, democratic, you see? And institutions are uh, well-rooted in democracy and in society and so sustained by people. Well, the political system uh, is much more complicated to, to explain what you know what happened there. Uh, the, the party system and the electoral system both require, you know, uh, innovations and, and transformation. The party system is very uh, weak. 
in, in the sense that to have uh, absolutely uh, uh, free uh, party organizations, we can create a party very easily, and you can co it's possible to compete. We have in Congress, I don't know now how, how many, but no less than 15 parties. And the important ones are four or five. Yeah. The rest are, are quasi-parties. Quasi yeah. They are instruments for uh, chantage and corruption, you see? And uh, a, a, a political, a, a member of a party can very easily uh, change from one part to another one, no barriers. And very opportunistically, this, it, it is, it, this is feasible, and uh, that process demoralizes the whole political uh, system uh, from the point of view of, of people. Uh, but on the other hand, it's true that the political system is, to, to some extent, uh, weak. Uh, but the Congress is strong, has been always strong. Brazilians don't, don't realize the fact that we have one of the oldest Congress in the world, parliaments in the world. Uh, our parliament started, like in Argentina, in 1823, 1823. And since that period on, only maybe during 10 years, the Congress was closed. Uh, the rest of time, was, the Congress was, was working. Even the military uh, maintained the Congress uh, working uh, with uh, enormous restrictions. But anyhow, the, the, the parliamentary life is a long life in Brazil. So we, we know how to, how to compromise, how to negotiate. This is not necessarily bad, because this is, uh, implies also the democratic gain. So it's an it's a, it's a old parliament and very strong. So when presidents believe that they are very strong because they have vote and they clash with the parliaments, normally the parliament wins. And the presidents are uh, impeached or they have to interrupt the government and so on and so forth. Even very popular uh, presidents like Quadros once or Collor again. Right? Receive a lot. I, I, I used to say, well, one person received in one point in time, one day, 40 million votes. But this was at that day. The president has not the right to, to, to say, oh, I have. No, I had. I don't have. <laughs> uh, it, because this is a tremendous mistake, because it gives to the president the sense that he's powerful, because he had vote. Uh, and, but the parliament is in day by day is working and trying to, 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 to put, in some case, obstacles to the, to the government or on the contrary. So you have to deal with that. Uh, I, I think that you have to, to, to maybe, it's extremely difficult, but it necessary some modifications. And the more diffic difficult modification is in the electoral system. We have a very complicated uh, representative system, uh, but very complicated system, and uh, probably uh, enormous distortion, because the, like dollar, it's not one person, uh, one rep uh, the, the same amount of people the same number of representatives. No, no. The small states have more, are overrepresented comparing to the big states. So this produces imbalances. But all these are very difficult questions. Uh, laws and, 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 and you know, bills are there, but the Congress refused to change because they, the deputies have been elected because of that. So why they will change that? It does require some, maybe some years later on will be possible to introduce modifications. But the basic is the democratization of society, and as a consequence in the future, I hope the political system, including the party system and the electoral system, will be you know, also modified to the better. Mr. President, thank you for your example and your wisdom and for sharing both with us tonight. Thank you very much. Es un desastre.